Hey, I'm Rod Kate. On August 14, 1981, I broke my neck playing high school football, leaving me paralyzed from the neck down. In a split second, I went from athlete to quadriplegic. After being told that my chances to ever walk again were almost zero, I worked my way back up to walking, and more importantly, to living. This podcast aims to motivate you not to allow life's sometimes devastating twists and turns ruin your quest for your best life through not only my eyes, but the lives of many of my future guests. Hi everyone, this is Rod Kate, and welcome to Rocket Motivation. We got a great guest today. His name is Kyle Blassingame from Athens, Tennessee. Kyle recently graduated from Tennessee Wesleyan University, which is also in Athens, Tennessee. In July 2019, Kyle was in a horrific automobile accident in which his friend died and Kyle sustained terrible injuries, breaking multiple bones in his body and was fortunate to survive. He eventually had his right leg amputated above the knee. He's never quit. He epitomizes the type of guests we want to bring to you. Kyle, welcome to Rocket Motivation. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So Kyle, what I, how I'd like to start is instead of getting right into the accident itself, why don't you kind of let's set the, the tone of the stage a little bit. Tell the listeners you know, wh- where you were in your life, what was going on in your life before the accident happened. Yeah, everything was going real great. My you know, health was looking really good. You know, Academics were going fantastic. So I went to Tennessee Wesleyan in order to just to cheer. That's what I had my eyes set on. And then near the end of freshman year, I was like, huh, you know, I really want to be able to get into something else too, something a little bit more competitive as well. And my fraternity brother actually was a track jumper. And he's like, you know, man, I think you do fantastic at this. I'm always down to try something new. So I was like, you know, why not? So I gave it a try and the coach extended me out a scholarship offer and everything. And then I started training um, that next summer. So I really started competing my sophomore year. All right. So here you are. Everything's going great. Well, you're less than a month before your senior year is about to start, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. We were we were like right at the month time period. Okay. So in July 2019, kind of tell us what you were doing and, you know, tell us about the accident, and how it all happened. Yeah. So, you know, July 18th, the night right before, you know, I mean, life was an everyday normal life for me. I went to our summer cheer practice that day. And then I went to work because I was working at the Athens Movie Palace and then um, went up to Knoxville because that's where Lane lived. And then we stayed the night and then we were on our way and we got to South Carolina about three, four o'clock, got to the Airbnb, went to the beach, went and got something to eat out at the beach, went to the pier. And then that's when the recollection and memories start to fade away. And then I woke up two days later in the hospital to both my parents being by my side, just really confused as to what was going on. I actually believe the first words I looked at them and said, why are you guys here? Because I, you know, I thought I just woke up out of like a dream and it did not settle in yet that I was actually in a hospital room, in a hospital bed and what has happened. But I know your, your parents told you when they saw you in the hospital, what happened. So tell the listeners what, what actually happened. But what happened was that there was a juvenile that made the decision to steal the vehicle that night and was on a high-speed chase with the police. And then the police chased this boy through numerous different streets at a very high speed. And then we got hit head on because we were at a complete dead stop. And we got hit head on at a little bit over 100 miles an hour is what they were rating it at. I mean, it was only just a two-door Honda Civic. It took substantial damage, and then um, it took them a little bit over two hours in order just to be able to get us out the car alone. And then I broke well over 16 bones between the head to toe with a couple of internal organ damages as well. Right. And your friend actually died in the accident, right? Passed away. They believe from um, brain injury. And some of your fractured bones, were they compound? In other words, with the bones sticking out? Um, The right one was actually the one that did break through the skin having a compound fracture right there between the knee and the femur joint. So fast forwarding a little bit, that's how the infection all occurred. But that was not anything that was evident at the time in South Carolina. You know, talk about your recovery. It was a very both a physical, mental and emotional recovery going on right there at the very beginning. um, Because, you know, he was still on the um, ventilator. And so, you know, you're dealing with that. You're dealing with what really all just happened and you're dealing with 
being extremely fortunate to still be alive. Um, in this recovery process, I was seeing a physical therapist and an occupational therapist. I had like two different sessions a day with them. And so at that time period, I believe the very first things that we were working on, because both legs took severe damage, there was really no movement. So I was learning how to be able to use a sliding board. So I was able to transfer myself from side to side of the bed or from the bed to a commode to be able to use the restroom. And they also had me a lift that I was able to be able to be lifted up and they would be able to scoot me on over so that I was able to actually be able to move. And so at that point, we were, you know, trying to be able to get me to start eating again, being able to make sure all my levels of my health were looking good. And then right there near the end when I was supposed to be able to leave me discharged, I was running 100, 200, 300, 4 temperatures. Nobody was figuring out what was wrong with me. You know, blood labs are coming back great. Bone scans are coming back good. Everything's looking to appear good. So I get sent home about August 1st of 2019. But the fevers are not going away. Um, you know, we were informed that it just appeared to be my body rejecting the hardware. And at that time, it then became apparent that it was actually an infection in my body. So then that is when I then went to Chattanooga Erlinger to have all my surgeries done. And then I was still seeing physical therapists, occupational therapists when I was there, as well as I had home health coming to my house working with me as well. So we were really just working on getting that leg strengthened up again, trying to get some knee mobility moving so that, you know, we're able to, because we were hoping I was going to be walking by end of September, early October. That was before the severity of the infection was well, known. And so you have, you have hardware, you have rod, metal rods and pins in both legs. Is that right? So I actually have a metal rod going all the way up in my left femur, as well as three screws in my knee. And then I have the prosthetic as well. And so you're, reco you're, you know, you're, you're doing your recovery, I guess, until the fever hits, you're getting better. Is that right? I mean, would you say that? Yes. Everything's looking, yeah, everything's looking great. But then I realized when I was running these fevers, I was just so weak. I mean, it was taking five, 10, 15 minutes just to transfer me from the side of the bed to one of those plastic toilets. Um, because I just didn't have any energy within my body to be able to physically move. Okay. Plus at this time, I also broke my hand. So then, you know, I'm trying to relearn how to be able to use my right hand again. Cause it was about two months until I was able to be able to use it again. So I'm having to relearn how to eat, being able to relearn how to write, being able to relearn those everyday activities with my hand again. Well, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, although our, our injuries were different, I mean, mine was a, mine was at one break, which was in my neck and a damage to my spinal cord that left me paralyzed. Your injuries were, of course, internal organs and, and multiple fractures instead of the one I had, but different injuries. But when I hear you tell your story, it, it's taken me back to all the rehab, you know, just trying to get up just to do the small things, learning to write. Like, right. you know, transfers. It's it's really interesting hearing your story on how it brings me back to, to some of the stuff I went through. Okay, so now we got this infection in your leg. It's not getting better. So what happens? So it took a lot of cleaning and debridement. Um, so at one point I had three surgeries within one week, just constantly trying to clean it out. You know, we're trying antibiotic powdered coating rods. We're trying antibiotic beads, leaving them in the body, letting them try to defeat the infection. Um, then you know, I'd get to come home for a little bit. And then the infection was coming out the body again. So I was right back in the hospital going through more surgeries. And, you know, I mean, it was just a back and forth between staying in the hospital, coming back home, staying in the, you know, doing treatments, doing labs, doing therapies. And then on the week of October 18th, my doctor just told me, you know, he was extremely devastated to have to break the news to me, but he was like, there's nothing else we can do. It's not getting any better. My bones are turning gray and green on the inside. Um, and then the fear started coming into is if we keep on fighting and keep trying to clean this out and destroy it, how much further is it going to move up the body? You know, could I lose the entire leg? You know, will, will it eventually go away? Then the October 17th, the night before the surgery, my knee swelled up so big, it was touching the external fixator that was on the outside of my right leg. And then because I kept praying and kept praying about it to just get a sign as to what's the right decision to make. And then that's when the sign was made. And then I was extremely fortunate for that decision to be made and that it's time for the amputation to take place and be able to move on and to be able to get ready to excel to the next chapter. Okay. 
you know, tell me what, you know, what's going through your mind right right now. I mean, you, you've you were getting ready to start your senior year. Everything was going great. You've been in this accident. You, you just horrific injuries. You know, you lost one of your best friends. Now the doctor's telling you we're going to have to amputate your right leg. I know you've got to have a d- bunch of different emotions going on. Uh, are you down? How? I, you know, which I would expect that you are. What's going on, and how are you dealing with it? Actually, on my third surgery, so which was the first one that I had at Erlinger, they kind of gave me right after the surgery. That's when we really learned how severe this was going to be. You know, he then informed me, you know, this is a limb threatening journey that we're about to go on. So that was when I had my hardest time with it, which would have been end of August. So, you know, every week that keeps moving on, I just have to keep telling myself, you know, be prepared that this is a chance. You know, that I don't I didn't want to get my hopes up of getting to keep my leg and then just get destroyed that it wasn't going to happen. Um, so when he actually when he finally told me, of course, emotional, you know, who wouldn't be when you're getting told that you're going to be losing your right leg or a any limb for that matter. Um, but, you know, then I really started soaking it in. I was like, you know, honestly, it's going to be OK. I'm finally going to get to get back into the things that I love to do. I'm actually going to get to live life again. Because, you know, laying there in the hospital bed, you know, you're not happy. You know, nobody can be happy when you're laying there, you know, missing your senior year of college and missing those activities that you love to get to do with your friends and your family. So when I learned that I was going to have the amputation, I was just kind of like this chapter of having to battle off this infection is finally coming to an end. I can finally get back into a new, my new normal of a life. And so, you know, I was honestly a little bit excited that I was going to be able to get back into the groove of things, being able to just live my life again and just be able to be happy once again. Well, and did you find that when you actually plug back in, that the improvement was even more so once you got back into your regular life? And and the reason I ask this, because, you know, I remember when when I got discharged from the rehab center, you know. I could actually walk. I was walking with those forearm crutches, which I know once you started, you were on the forearm crutches too, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. But but once I got back in, but like for me, it was getting back to high school. For you, it was getting back to your senior year of college. Once I plugged back in, to me, looking back on it, it was kind of amazing how much I improved really mentally and physically just by getting back into the groove of things. Did you find that, that to be the case for you? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, not to just, you know, to finally be out of my bed and not to just be bedridden anymore and just to be able to get back out, you know, just, I mean, back out with friends, you get to feel like a little bit of your normal life is coming back to you. So, you know, that was definitely phenomenal to get to be able to enjoy and just be able to encounter that. Right. And the thing about it too is, I mean, you're, you're, here you are, your leg is amputated, you're going you to get a prosthetic, you're going to at least get back to some sense of normalcy. So, so what's next? You get the prosthetic, you get back to school. So tell us what happens then. I finally am getting to go to school. I'm getting around fairly decent. I mean, it was extremely, extremely difficult to get around. A, you know, I've had this prosthetic maybe three weeks at this point before I went back to school. This is the first time I'm really up and walking because the most movement I would do is that physical therapy. And so, but I just felt so great. I, you know, it just felt incredible just to be able to look back even just a couple months ago and be thinking, you know, here I was laying in the hospital bed, recovering, trying to battle this. And now here I am at school. And so my next chapter was, to, you know, to think, okay, I've got to finish off my senior year strong, you know, what I have left of it. Because I was doing online school my first semester when I was in the hospital. So I was trying to, you know, do school, battle everything, mentally wrap my head around all of it. So when I got back to school, I was like, okay, well, I was thinking back what the semester I just had. I was like, this semester is going to be easy compared to what I just had to go through. And so then my first goal was to be like, you know, I want to return back to cheerleading. You know, I know physically I'm not going to be able to tumble anymore. I'm not going to be able to lift people at the moment. But just for me to be able to be out there and finish out the season with my teammates is something that I wanted to be able to do. Okay. Were, you, were you able to do that? Yes, I got medical clearance from my doctor. So I got to cheer. I believe it was about four basketball games. I was able to make it back out there. And again, that was extremely difficult. Just be able to stand for that period of time on my legs. It was a, it was very tiring, and you know, in the heat and everything. 
but it was something I wanted to do. So I was determined enough to say, I'm finishing out this season with my teammates. This is something I came into in freshman year. I'm going to finish. You're plugging back in. Your life is, you know, at least physically completely different. And I know, I know how that is. You know, when I went back, it, you know, I went from being an, an athlete to someone who could barely walk. Um, but I plugged back in too, and I, I moved on. How was it that you did it and stayed positive? So in my mind, I was thinking that there was no point on dwelling on the negatives of what's happening. Of course, you're going to have bad days. All of us have a bad day and bad days. But for me, it was there's no sense of dwelling on everything that's happened and dwelling on these negatives because I can't go back in time. You know, a motto I'd love to live by is that you no one in this world, none of us can ever change our past. We cannot change what has happened to us, but what we can change is our future. So, you know, my thought process is there's no point of being negative and being down about all this because it's not going to precede me any further in life. I'm not going to get any further, but what I will get further is staying positive and keeping those goals in my mind and what I want to achieve. Right. That's how I'm going to be able to move forward and be able to reach my highest potential possible. And let me follow up on that, because I think this is an an important question or something that I think is important for the listeners to find out is, I mean, you've got this great positive attitude. Like going back to the accident, and I'm kind of comparing it to, to my situation, you guys were just in a car. You weren't doing anything wrong. You didn't contribute to this accident. You've got this kid who steals a car and is fleeing from the cops, and he just smashes into you at 100 miles an hour. You know, with my situation, you know, I broke my neck making a, a tackle. Not that I would say I would did anything wrong, but it, I mean, I participated in my injury where you guys didn't participate in, in, in your injury. I, I would think that there would be some anger. I, I would probably be angry if, you know, I was just minding my own business, doing what I'm supposed to do. And, you know, out of nowhere, I suffer some of this this horrific accident like you did. I mean, did, was there any, did you ever have any anger? And, and if so, you know, how'd you move past it? Oh, of course. You know, it really made you think, of course, you have the thoughts of why me? You know, what did I do wrong to deserve this? Or, you know, what have I done for this to be able to happen? And, you know, it's really hard when you lay down at night to think nothing you did caused this all because of a group of people's actions. That's what happened. So of course, I'm extremely angry at the time period, you know, just thinking, it really just opened up your eyes to think people's actions not only affect themselves, but affects everyone around you, no matter how minor, how major. And then there's just, you know, nothing I can do about it anymore. I just have to keep moving forward. All we can do is pray that the individuals involved are going to make changes in their life and not make those same mistakes to where more lives are either taken or severely morphed for the rest of their life and the families and friends around them being affected. Right. Tell the um, listeners about your support system and how that how the people in your life have, have made a difference in your, your recovery. For starters, my family. Um, so, you know, within my household, it's my mom, my dad, and my little brother, who's 17, but, you know, both of them, mom was off work for eight weeks. Her work was phenomenal working with her. But then my dad also stopped working altogether so that he could be my full-time nurse. And then, you know, of course, my little brother is also in high school at this time. But, I mean, they were by my side day and night. They were, one of them was constantly by my side in the hospital. I was never in the hospital alone. Um, you know, they stayed there. They slept right there on that little couch that they give you in the hospital. I was extremely fortunate to go to a school like Tennessee Wesleyan that was so small and you were able to make those such close connections with one another. And so I had friends coming over the house constantly. You know, I could not have asked for a better support system. I had community members holding fundraisers for all the medical expenses. I was extremely, extremely fortunate because I truly could not have done this on my own. And I'm sure you've told your parents how thankful you are for them. Oh, every day. I mean, they still have, I mean, you know, they still are helping me with those certain things that I've not been able to fully be able to do on my own just yet. Now, one thing I want to tell the listeners is, now, Kyle, you and I have met live before, correct? Yes. So I was at, speaking at Tennessee Wesleyan University. This was uh, January, into January of this year. I, I, I gave a talk up there to some of the students, which was a fantastic experience. And and Kyle was was in the audience. So we got to talk afterwards. And you know, Kyle, at the time you had your, you, you were walking with the forearm crutches, right? 
Yes. Yeah. And, and it just, it, it took me back to mind because I, you know, I, I did the same, but now are you walking with any, any crutches or canes or anything like that? So, you know, right now, um, as long as I, when I have my prosthetic on, I am not anymore. Um, you know, I've been able to be able to get around, um, you know, sometimes need some help still, you know, like going down hills, up hills, stairs, um, cause you know, not everywhere has handrails and st- things like that. So, you know, especially like stairs with no handrails, that's very difficult. Um, so the only time I'm ever having to use anything is when I do not have my prosthetic on, I, you know, have to use my rolling walker to be able to get around my house and stuff. But other than that, I'm actually being able to walk and it took 11 months to be able to walk without a left um, assistive devices. So almost a year until I was able to be able to put them down and just be able to go. Right. And that's, I mean, that was a lot of work to get to that point, right? Oh yes. So, I mean, you know, very extremely tiring. I mean, it was a lot of physical therapy sessions, getting my strength back up, my endurance up. But, you know, one day I just said, I have to let go of these, you know, I, I'm going to have to just keep pushing myself. So, you know, I try to push myself, you know, walk, this little bit of distance. Okay, now let's try expanding it to this amount of distance without them. And then, you know, let's just keep adding on a little bit more and a little bit more until there was that comfort level and that security of wanting to be able to just move freely. Right. But you've also been able to do some other physical activities. I think I saw that you were able to ride a bike. Yes. Yeah. I went to Hilton Head, South Carolina, right after our graduation or commencement celebration and um they told us you know riding bikes was a really big thing around there and i'm like cool let's do it and a lot of people are thinking you know they're like you know not to be offensive in any way but are you able to ride a bike and i was like i was like listen i can do anything that you could do i was like i may have to work 10 times harder at it but i can physic i'm going to be able to complete anything that you're able to complete so it's definitely like riding a bike again, you know, like when you're four years old trying to relearn how to ride a bike. I, I went through, you know, that terror of falling over and, you know, having to have somebody be right by your side, helping push you through. But once I was able to find the rhythm and the groove of everything, um, it was extremely incredible being able to do it again. And just the other day, I went and played golf over there at that Top Golf in Chattanooga. So that was a lot of fun getting to do. I've been able to swim again. Um, so I've been able to, you know, get back in the groove of some of those physical activities that I love to do. Right. You know, based on my experience, you're going to get a lot of the, are you sure you can do that physically questions. Right. Um, but, you know, the answer always is, is either yes, or I'm going to try. Exactly. I may, I may try and I may fail, but yeah. I tried. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's better to try to ride the bike and fall over than never try to ride the bike. Right, because then on that car ride home, I'd always been wondering, could I rode that bike? Right, exactly. Tell the listeners where you are now in your life. So what, I mean, what, what are your plans going forward? Yeah, so currently I coach cheerleading at a local gym called East Tennessee Elite Athletics that came here to Athens. So I get to do that a couple times a week. I'm very small working, so it's perfect because, you know, I'm starting to be able to get back in the groove of working. It's something that I love to do love the kids. I love the competition factor of being able to help them and see them succeed and get to do the things that I once got to do. You know, I'm currently taking a physics class online as a prerequisite for graduate school. I'm also studying for the GRE for graduate school. And then I'm hoping to apply for graduate school and be able to get started in 2021. So that's where I'm hoping to get it in my master's in athletic training is what I'm wanting to do. And I think it'd be such an incredible field to be able to help athletes and be able to just show them, you know, yes, you're injured. Yes, you're going to be missing practices, games, possibly even a season, but there's always a recovery. There's always that chance to be able to get back into what you love to do. And, and Kyle, this is how I'd like to, to end the interview is we all go through adversity. You know, some's worse than others. Some's physical, some's emotional, some's mental, some's spiritual. Based on your experience, what you've been through, you know, what thoughts do you have to tell the listeners on on the best way to handle adversity? Way that I can best say to handle everything is that you have one life to live. When none of us get do overs, there's no redo button in life. You get one life, and there's no sense of holding yourself back because of other people's actions or words. You know, there's no point of worrying, you know, what will people think? How will people perceive me? What will people's perception be of me? All of us are going to deal with adversity, like you said, some very small, some of us a lot bigger. 
you can't have that fear of going out in public and being scared that people are going to be staring at you. You know, you can't have that fear of knowing that you're going to be struggling to do something physically and wondering about the laughter or the, the stares, you know, the embarrassment, because this is your life to live. You know, none of us are promised the next second in our life, but the best thing that you can do is live your life to the fullest and do the things that you love with the people that you love. Well, that, that's a that's a great way to to go about it, and it's to hear you say that. It, it, there's it's just there's so much parallels to to my life. Also, if I was worried about what I look like to other people when I'm walking around, I'd never leave the house. You know, you I would never try right. anything. I, I would. I think one thing, like from my experience, and 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 it's probably for you too. It's it certainly made me a tougher person inside. You know, you can handle a lot of stuff. Like you said, the stairs, you get the stairs from people who see you walk around. Um, and, you know, for me, it just focused me more on my life. And I think I'm, I'm almost parroting what you said, because it, it's just amazing when I when I listen to you, your answer, uh, it, it, everything you said is exactly how I've lived my life. It's just, this is your life. You have one life and you got to make the best of it. Right. And then, you know, especially when we go through battles, such as both of us have been through, it just gives you a whole new perspective on life and you just see everything so much differently. And like you said, you know, it definitely makes you stronger and it definitely makes you so much more grateful for those small things that we have in life and that those abilities that we're able to do that a lot of people take for granted and you don't realize that they can be taken from you in a blink of an eye. It just opens up your mind to a whole brand new world whenever your your life changes forever. And I'm extremely just, it just made me so much more grateful and thankful for those things that I have in my life. Right. Well, Kyle, man, I love the story. And, you know, another great thing that the, that the listeners need to know is, Kyle, you, you know, you live in Athens, Tennessee, and that's where I grew up as a kid. My mom's still there. And so I'll probably be up during Thanksgiving, Kyle. And when I do, we got to go grab some lunch, okay? Oh, that'd be perfect. I'd love to. Okay, Kyle, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks a lot, Kyle. No, thank you. Man, what a great story of getting back up from Kyle Blassingame. To go from a tragic car wreck where he loses his best friend and his leg to have the ability and strength to keep moving forward in life with such a positive attitude. That's what rocket motivation is all about. Kyle displays the traits of rocket motivation, specifically the tenacity to roll with the punches during the tough times of recovery when things look so grim, and his never-quit attitude. I can see why he was a cheerleader at college, and that's why I know he's such a fantastic role model to the cheerleader students he's currently training. If you want to see how Kyle is doing and keep up with him, I know he's got a Facebook account, so you can um, follow him there and, and send him a friend request. I'm sure he'd have no problem accepting your friend request. Well, this wraps up our second episode of Rocket Motivation, and next week we'll talk to our next gutsy guest. He's a pro baseball player who kept hustling and grinding, even though he never made it to the show. And we will talk about passion, drive, and redefining your dreams with Tim Battle. I can't wait for you to hear him and his Rocket Motivation story. Thanks for listening to the show. If you're interested in getting my book, Get Back Up, just go to Amazon and put in Get Back Up and my name, Rod Caden, it'll pop right up. I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast and rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it if you'd share it with a friend. I would like as many people to hear my message as possible. And we'll see you next week. Never give up and always get back up.